Jetpack was one of the best ZX Spectrum games written by Ultimate Play the Game. Released in 1983, the game involves building and fueling your spacecraft while fighting off hordes of hostile aliens. Its simple but addictive gameplay makes it an ideal game for beginner programmers to rebuild. So let's get coding! Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. I'm Bob Grant and in this video we're going to do a game deconstruction. I'll be taking an existing game and breaking it apart to find out how it works so that we can use it as a programming project and rebuild it for ourselves. Today's game is Jetpack. It's a 1983's game for the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, Commodore VIC-20 and BBC Micro. So let's start by taking a look at the actual game. In Jetpack, the game revolves around your Jetman having to assemble and fuel your spaceship. When the game starts, your ship is broken up into three parts. You have to pick up each part in order and drop it on top of the previous section until the spaceship is complete. Once you've built your ship, fuel pods start dropping from the sky which you have to collect and drop into your spaceship. Each fuel pod adds a little bit of fuel to your craft. So let me just speed that up a bit so we can get our ship filled up. Once you've filled up your spaceship, you need to walk inside it and it will launch towards the top of the screen and take you on to the next level. On the next levels, you only have to fuel your spaceship to be able to proceed. After about five levels, you'll have to rebuild a new spaceship to continue the game. To move your Jetman, you've got a left and right button plus a thrust key to move you vertically upwards. If you release the thrust key, your man will start to fall under gravity. In each level, there are a large number of hostile aliens to shoot. There are four distinct movement patterns for these aliens, but we'll have a look at those when we get into the game. This game also features three platforms on which objects can land and which you and the aliens have to negotiate your way around. So if we start our game deconstruction then, by first of all looking how the player character moves around the screen. Whilst we're on the ground or on one of the platforms, we can obviously walk left and walk right. And the speed at which we walk then is slightly slower than if we take off and fly. And when we're flying then of course we move slightly faster. And we use our thrust key then to move up the screen. Falling is done under gravity, but if you watch, we actually reach a terminal velocity quite quickly. So that doesn't get faster and faster as we fall. Similarly, when we take off, we go up the screen, but we, again, we have a maximum vertical speed. The first objective then is to construct your ship. And we do this by picking up the various parts of the ship, simply by walking into them. Once we've walked into it, that object's position then is tracked against our player position to stay with us until we hit this active band above our ship construction area. And at that point, the object is dropped and it simply falls under gravity, again at this constant speed, until it hits and lands on the top of the ship. And again, this then will be exactly the same for our fuel pods as we collect them, pick them up and then drop them onto our ship. So once our ship is constructed, then fuel pods start to arrive, dropping from the top of the screen and landing either on the ground or on one of the platforms. And again, these fall under gravity at that constant speed. And as well, you'll notice then there are other special um, bonus uh, ships that fall down, which you can simply walk into to collect extra points. As we then fill up the ship, once one fuel pod has been added to our ship, then the next one comes until we completely fill the actual spaceship and it's ready then for takeoff. For general collision detection throughout the game then, there are a couple of things we need to look at. Um, general stuff with the bullets and the aliens and the player all touching each other, um, that can be just normal bounding box collision detection and that'll be f absolutely fine for this type of game. But the one area which we do need to have a bit of a think about then are the platforms. 
for objects falling from the top of the screen. Um, it's, it's quite simple. Um, all they do is once they touch any of the platforms or, or the ground, they simply stay in that position. So there's no problems with working out how to handle them. But for other objects touching the platforms, we're going to have to work out which edge of the platform they've actually collided with. For the player, if we hit the bottom or the left or the right of a platform, then that stops our movement. But if we land on top of a platform, then we go into walking mode, where we can then walk left and right along the platform. So this means that our collision detection, we're going to have to modify it slightly so that it not only detects when we collide, but which edge of the objects have collided. So if we were to consider our player object then coming down towards the top of a platform. So to begin with then, the player object and their bounding box will actually be above the platform. And we saw in the bounding box, if we look at that tutorial, and I'll put a link up on the top corner there, and we're looking at overlaps between the boxes, um, both left and right overlaps, and then vertical overlaps. So to begin with, our player bounding box is horizontally overlapped with the platform bounding box, but as yet it's still above, so we don't have any vertical overlap. But as the player object falls then, eventually that bottom edge of its bounding box will overlap with the top edge of the platform's bounding box. And of course this will now give us a, an actual collision. But we need to be able to say where the collision took place. So what our system will need to do, it will need to remember what the previous position of the object was. And then when we get the collision, it will have to check for which of the overlaps is now new. So in this particular instance, uh, we have the horizontal overlaps already in place. But this particular collision, the vertical overlap at the bottom edge of the player object and the top edge of the platform that's where we now have this new overlap which created the collision. And that then means that we can detect that it's the top of the platform that the player has hit. So once we have this information, our software can then take the appropriate action and put our player into walking mode along the top of the platform. And again, we're going to be seeing this again when we come to the alien detection, where again they need to decide what happens when they hit a platform and which way they bounce or, or whether they explode. So if we now start looking at the aliens and the way in which they move, um, there are really about five distinct movement patterns for our aliens. The very first one then, when we get to the very first level, is a very simple pattern where the, um, in this case, meteor sort of balls, they are generated at each edge of the screen. And then they simply move in a straight line from one side to the other. And if they hit anything, obviously they explode. And if they hit the player, then they of course kill the player object. But these ones just simply move in a straight line. And the angle at which they move is, is set when they first um, start. So there's a slight variation in the angle that they can take as they move across, but very much then they are moving in a straight line. So the second set of aliens then um, move in diagonal lines, uh, and they then are able to bounce off objects. So they bounce off the top of the screen, the ground, and any of the platforms. And they bounce really at, um, just as, as you would normally expect, um, but always in 45 degree angles. And the only thing which actually kills them then obviously is the um, player shooting them, or them hitting the player object itself. They don't track the player, they just simply bounce until they collide with one of the objects that they bounce off, and then they bounce. But when they collide with any of the platforms, you will need to use our technique for discovering which edge they've hit, because um, obviously that will then control which actual way that they're going to rebound from that object. We then have a variation on this theme where the aliens now are able to rebound off objects and again they're still moving generally in 45 degree angles but they can also then go move horizontally and they can also change their direction um, either when they hit an object they can actually uh, rebound but not as, a, as an actual rebounding process but actually they choose a direction to travel in and, and sometimes when they're just generally flying around they can then um, change their direction as well.
Um, so again, they're still not necessarily tracking you and trying to collide with the player, um, but they are doing a slightly more randomized mo motion. Our next pattern then is a variation again on our meteors idea. Um, this time we have little planes uh, and they start at either edge of the screen, but they do hover for a while, just um, oscillating up and down, and then they set off and they will set off and track the player motion. So again, they're moving um, in in lines from one side of the screen to the other. So they never they never turn back on themselves, um, but they do. If you watch, um, if they start off above the player, they will head um, downwards towards him and, and so on. And as they reach the same vertical level as the player, they will then track and fly horizontally. Um, so they are aiming to hit the player, but again, not, not in, a, in a terribly accurate sort of way. And again, these ones as well, if they do collide with an object such as a platform or the ground, they do just simply explode. And this brings us then to the final movement pattern. Uh, and these, and, and these ones are little flying saucers, um, they will exactly track the player ship. So these ones are trying to find you and crash into you. Um, and, and, and they obviously still bounce off the platforms and so on. But you can see that they are tracking and always moving towards the player position. So these are obviously the original alien movements and, and types. But again, as you're programming this game yourself, you get full choice then as to what you have happening in your, in your software. The last thing then really for us to have a look at are the actual player bullets. So these, these laser trails that go across the screen, and indeed they wrap around the far edge of the screen and, and reappear then on the other side. So if we have a very close look at how these are formed, we'll actually see that each individual laser shot is made from a number of small line segments. So these line segments are created in order, um, extending out from where our player is shooting. But each one starts off as a full line segment, but gradually reduces in size um, with its leftmost side staying fixed and the rightmost edge then being the one that recedes towards the left hand edge. So each press of the fire button, instead of generating just one player bullet, will actually generate a whole stream of them to form this line. Each of those will then be a small line segment, which will actually be stationary, but which will do this then starting off as a full line and gradually decreasing in size until it disappears. So that's really my deconstruction of Jetpack. Um, so let's say it's it's a really good project to pick up, um, especially if you are beginning in your games programming um, learning curve. So I've identified then all the points that I would be looking at and how I'd be sort of considering modeling them. If you are brand new to programming, um, I would advise you do a, a programming course such as my beginner's course um, for Space Invaders. And that will cover all of the techniques you'll need to be able to code this particular game as well. Um, especially then if you go on and do my Asteroids course, which is sort of what I would term my level two beginner's course, that will definitely give you all the skills you need to build this game and even more complex games. And again, I'll put links up in the top corner so that you can get to those quite easily. So again, wh whether you're programming in Tick80, which is what I've been using in quite a few of my courses, um, or, or Python, or HTML, or, or whatever gaming system you're using, um, any of these retro games, they are very good and very fun projects that you can knock off in, in a couple of days or a weekend. So please do have a look at these. Um, I'll be making more of these sorts of videos. Um, so have a look at those as well and pick a game which you think would make a really good project for you. And really just enjoy pl playing games, coding them and having lots of fun. So see you soon and bye for now. Don't forget to visit the course pages for this project. There you'll be able to download the code for this lesson and get lots of extra hints and tips. You'll also get access to all my other programming, electronics and gaming projects. All the links are in the description below. For more games programming, electronics projects and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.